Today, I'll be talking about the role of transnationalism in some of the work that I've been doing and trying to highlight some of the opportunities and some of the challenges of undertaking transnational approaches to digital humanities. And you'll hear me talking about this both at the level of, you know, how do we construct knowledge in a field, particularly through our work on the Digital Black Atlantic volume? How do we organize our field in, in terms of, of global and, and transnational focus through our professional organization. So it'll be these multiple registers of um, thinking about transnationalism. So I wanna first begin by reflecting a little bit on the status of the nation, but generally, but then also really the nation and its role in digital humanities. There are few forms of geopolitical organization that are more deeply linked to colonialism than the nation. As we saw waves of independence movements uh, trying to free themselves from European colonial powers, particularly around the mid 20th century, the nation really became a powerful tool for liberation movement. So we want to form a new nation. We want to be free. We want to throw off the shackles of colonialism. And what happened as a result is that the nation state became the ideal of the sovereign, of the sovereign state and what sovereign statehood meant. So the 20th century was certainly a century of nation uh, building. On the one hand, we can think of nation building connoting the work of forming a new nation. Uh, once you've achieved independence, consolidating an identity, negotiating multiple languages and multiple cultures and trying to create a shared national identity and building what Benedict Anderson has called the nation's imagined community. But on the other hand, nation building can invoke the interference of colonial powers like the US, where I am located, uh, which is, have sought to expand their sphere of influence in formerly colonized countries you know, for their own advantage, right? So you may remember the US wars in Afghanistan and Iraq being positioned as nation building, this sort of paternalistic idea of something that we're doing for the benefit of people in Afghanistan and Iraq, but really no, actually um, it's an attempt of expanding uh, the you know, US imperialism and cultural colonialism um, under the guise of we're going to install democratically elected governments and shape the nation. And I should note that US nation building is not something that only started 20 years ago. In fact, you know, the entire 20th century has been uh, full of examples early in the century in Haiti and Philippines, of course, Vietnam, um, interventions in Lebanon, Grenada. It's been persistent throughout the 20th and into the 21st century. This sort of question about the relationships between nations and colonialism and digital humanities have been a chief matter of concern in my research. And namely, I have focused on how we can ensure that our work in digital humanities doesn't unthinkingly replicate colonialism both in terms of representation in our content and in the tools and the methods that we use. And so this was the subject of my first book, New Digital Worlds, Post-Colonial Digital Humanities in Theory, Praxis and Pedagogy. So to talk about to this relationship to, uh, between that work and the concept of nation, I wanna rewind a little bit and talk about when I first started doing work at the intersections of post-colonial studies and digital humanities. And that early work raised some questions both about US imperialism, 
uh, and the role of the nation in digital humanities. Uh, James Smithies, uh, who is a wonderful person and good friend, uh, you know, was very, very frank in his critiques of the ideas behind postcolonial digital humanities pre-book. And he wondered if it was, uh, and I quote, simply the intellectual follow on to Bush's adventures. So that is uh, George W. Bush in Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, and quote, an inevitable smothering of post-colonialism by the only remaining superpower. Uh, so that's some harsh words, but it was really great to talk to him and to hear his thinking as somebody who, was reading and thinking about post-colonial studies in a context other than the US because it really helped me refine my, my thinking and my frames of reference. Um, and what I came to recognize was that I had to navigate between the ways that post-colonial studies as it formed in the academy has in many ways been over-determined by scholars who are located in the US uh, simply because of academic hiring processes and because of the resources that US universities invested in the 1980s and 1990s to hire uh, post-colonialists. And his comment signaled to me, and this was so critical to writing my first book, um, that we needed to be localizing how we th think about digital humanities. And in the context of colonialism to localize the histories and localize the present of colonialism in the context in which we invoke it. So for example, in the US, we have to contend with these tensions between how post-colonialism as a form of critical theory has managed to both offer some crucial insights on globalization and questions of representation and materialism, but also has been curiously silent on the fact that the US is a settler colony that presently on engaged ongoing in colonialism. Even when post-colonial studies makes moves towards critiquing US imperialism, it's always the US imperialism over there abroad, uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, without really looking inward at how the, even the universities that we're working in are producing the conditions in which we theorize have benefited from indigenous dispossession and genocide. And this matter of a localization really came into sharper focus for me when Paul Barrett is in Canada, noted uh, that you know, along with the critiques of the relationship between colonialism and knowledge production that were being made by those of us who were trying to advance post-colonial approaches to digital humanities, a noticeable absence was what he called the continued salience of the nation as an organizing structure and a category of analysis. And so then the question really was for me, as I was writing the book, you know, did local mean national? Um, and this is a question to take seriously, both at the level of the scholarship that we're doing and at the broader scale of how we create the institutions that support our work, like scholarly organizations. There's perhaps nowhere that we have seen these tensions playing out uh, more clearly than in the Alliance of Digital Humanities Organizations, or ADHO, where the global and the local get extrapolated to the world stage. That's sort of its own talk and actually is an entire chapter in New Digital World, so I'll just give you a little abbreviated version, which is that in 2005, ADHO was formed bringing together the US-based Association for Computers and the Humanities, of which I'm currently the co-vice president, and uh, uh, it's the association ALLC, the Association for Literary and Linguistic Computing, which is now what we know of as EADH or the European Association of Digital Humanities. Uh, other geographically based, although not necessarily national organizations joined. So it's Canada, uh, Australasia, so that's not national, um, but regional, Japan, Latin America, and more. <clears throat> 
Uh, the geographical trend was bucked by Centernet, which represents digital humanity centers around the world, and Humanistica, which is a Francophone organization. In 2012, a number of us were involved in the early formation of Global Outlook Digital Humanities, or, GLO or GoDH, which is a special interest of ADHO that was formed in response to the ways that work by practitioners of digital humanities in the US and Canada and Western Europe was overshadowing the rest of the world. So our emphasis in those early years of, of GoDH was on breaking down barriers to collaboration among digital humanists around the world. And at some point in this work, we were asked by ADHO to uh, be, uh, to be sort of a gateway to bring in new national organizations. So that we would kind of be working with people and say, oh, hey, you should start, you know, the, you know, Samoan Digital Humanities Organization. Uh, and we rejected that idea uh, because, well, A, we really didn't think our role was to try and push digital humanities organizations onto people, but also that we were not the right people to be mediating what kind of organization made the most sense in any given geographic region. Uh, so there may be some places where nation is a completely sensible organizational logic, and there may be an area where a regional approach might make sense, but ultimately that needs to be made uh, a decision needs to be made by practitioners in those spaces, not by random people in an organization. Um, so not by us. So that's to say, when we talk about the local in digital humanities, in some in instances, it may be national, but it is not implicitly national and nor should it be. On the geopolitical stage, as we've seen in just the last six years or so, We've seen the limitations of the nation as an organizing principle. Uh, it, you know, it, it's, it's when you can't even convince people that they should sort of work together or, you know, get vaccines or wear masks or do things that would benefit their fellow people. And to what extent can we really count on the nation as an organizing logic if we don't see some kind of common cause or relationship to each other uh, in the midst of a threat? like a deadly pandemic. We've seen the resurgence of nationalism as a corrosive political force. Uh, we've seen the acceptance of xenophobic nationalism in the US and other countries around the world, the anti-immigrant discourses that have brought populist governments into mainstream uh, politics. And it's important to recognize that even though we're doing academic work, we have to be cognizant of the ways that virulent forms of nationalism can implicitly and explicitly shape our scholarship or our funding sources or the politics of our universities and not assume that the work we're doing exists outside of these forces. And just as a side note, it's also crucial to remember that nations are complex. They may bring together people from different racial or ethnic backgrounds, languages, cultures, and these differences come with their own forms of social stratification. Across those differences, we can see, for example, differences in access to resources. I'm so thinking about this in the context of academic work and the digital humanities, using my example in the US, until July 1st, I work at Salem State University, which is an underfunded public university that serves a student population that is racially and ethnically diverse. They come from predominantly working class or lower, lower socioeconomic backgrounds. My students don't have access to the same kind of resources as my students at Dartmouth after July 1st will. Um, so we are even within a national context, there are these different levels of inequities that we have to negotiate and think about as we do our work. 
And then on top of that, if you work in areas of research like mine, so I, my background is in post-colonial and African diaspora studies, um, you've watched as the federal funded resources for digital humanities have typically gone to projects about canonical people and canonical histories. Um, and quite a lot of long dead white men. And, you know, that's, it's a, it's a challenge. So at the national level, even we need to be thinking about these stratifications and these unequal forms of distribution of resources because we all have them. And to be asking ourselves, how are the practices that we are undertaking trying to avoid contributing to that stratification? Um, and how are we thinking about centering the voices of the most vulnerable and the most marginalized people and using that as a rubric or a guideline for redistribution of resources that can resist those inequalities. So many of these nation level inequalities are linked to transnational histories, which was sort of the impetus for my work with Dr. Kelly Baker Josephs on the Digital Black Atlantic, which was published in 2021 in the Debates in the Digital Humanities series at the University of Minnesota Press. Um, so as I mentioned before, my educational background is uh, post-colonial and African diaspora studies. Dr. Josephs, background, uh, educational background is in Caribbean studies. And so our, the volume was for us a way of bridging the myriad ways that we talk about the intersections of black studies and digital humanities. And these have gone by a lot of different terms or they've been reflected in many terms like e-black studies, black code studies, black digital humanities, African American digital humanities, the Caribbean digital, post-colonial digital humanities, African digital humanities, uh, and, and more. And for us, it was really a recognition that all of these subfields, what we want to call them, areas of study, they are all linked by the roots and the routes of the African diaspora over many centuries. So we found common cause for ourselves um, in Paul Gilroy's articulation of the Black Atlantic and his book of the same title, which was published in 1993. And Gilroy's Black Atlantic really affected this sort of seismological shift in Black studies that created space and language for conceptualizing Blackness across the Americas, the Caribbean, Britain, Europe, and Africa. So for the, us, the concept of, of Black Atlantic allowed us to think across national borders that so often de define and delimit knowledge production uh, towards instead an emphasis on Black diasporic connectivity. We sought to delink African diaspora knowledge production from what Gilroy terms the intellectual heritage of the West since the Enlightenment in favor of promoting connections among African diasporic communities of practice. Uh, we wanted a way to acknowledge the role that the intertwined histories of colonialism and slavery have played in accelerating the dispersion of, the, of African descended peoples and cultures. But we wanted to center um, resistance and survival. We wanted to speak to the way that Black people have always been intimately familiar with technologies, both repressive and emancipatory, whether the ship, musical instruments, games, social media, or algorithms. We wanted to push back against the ways that the most frequently told stories are ones of technologies being used against Black peoples globally. And instead to focus on the ways that African and African diasporic communities build on their familiarity with technology to appropriate it and use it to their advantage. 
It's important to note that since Gilroy's initial work, scholars have expanded the utility of the Black Atlantic as both a methodological approach and an object of study. So of particular interest to us as we constructed the volume were some of the critiques of the Black Atlantic. So for example, Gilroy's work is critiqued for being Anglo-American centered. Um, and given you know, the bias towards the so-called global North uh, and towards Anglo-American monolingualism mono that already exists in digital humanities, we really wish to avoid repeating Gilroy's positioning of the Black Atlantic as an Anglo-American phenomenon. We wish to bring together all of these themes as a volume to provide a recognizable language and a vocabulary for it that spans the breadth of interdisciplinary scholarship in both digital studies and digital humanities, including disciplines as varied as literary studies and history and library information, science, musicology, communications, and more. So we were very much thinking of the digital Black Atlantic as a product of juxtaposition of disciplines of cultures, methods, and languages. But as W.E.B. Du Bois's work reminds us, juxtaposition is never simply about mere addition, but rather this kind of transformative and alchemical move where the sum of the parts are much greater than the whole and where analytical possibilities are opened up in the act of juxtaposition. And that, in a sense, is what transnationalism for DH is in the digital Black Atlantic. It's not, it's not simply work that draws on many national traditions. In fact, as I hinted earlier, the idea of a national tradition is itself an imaginary one forged out of many juxtapositions. So perhaps we could say that transnationalism is a juxtaposition of national juxtapositions that gestures towards the complex uh, relations within and among geographic positionalities. So I want to pause for a minute and just highlight tensions between discourses of global digital humanities and the digital Black Atlantic. Uh, because in many ways, I feel like there's a tendency in the academy to pit uh, areas of study that have been minoritized against each other and to try and sort of make them compete for airtime and compete, compete for space. So when Dr. Josephs and I pitched the volume in the first place, the Digital Black Atlantic volume, there were some hesitations coming from the editorial side. One concern was that they were already doing a volume on global digital humanities. So wouldn't the volumes be competing for an audience or wouldn't they be competing for the same writers if they weren't appropriately spaced years apart? Another issue that came up was, would there be an audience for a topic that in the views on the side of the press was so niche. Just to quickly dispense with the idea that this is somehow a niche topic, we have a built-in audience that's quite significant precisely because the Digital Black Atlantic cuts across African diaspora studies, Caribbean studies, Latinx studies, African-American studies, Black British, Afro-Canadian, African, Afro-European, Afro-Latin. I mean, I could just keep going on, right? Um, and this sort of supposedly niche audience uh, is actually scholarship that is distinct from and part of a very long tradition, uh, an analog tradition, um, if you will, uh, that has existed longer than what global digital humanities is. And so I point this out to suggest that transnationalism can't simply mean, you know, everything that is not from the global north that you just put all together, or everything that is not white, you know, gets cordoned off into its own space, and then the global essentially becomes this space of otherness. 
Um, it's not we did global, so now we're good and can move on to other things, but rather, you know, we did global and we talked about what it means to put the diverse practices of scholarship that are happening around the world in conversation with each other and how we can learn precisely from that juxtaposition. And it opens up space for even more attention to the local and the national and to the transnational. So with that series of, of conversations in mind, for us, the volume became one where we were seeking to intervene in the space where Blackness and technology meet to push back against the ways that technologies have historically been and continue to be used to disempower Black communities and also to the dominance of that narrative that technology is always necessarily repressive for Black people. Um, and to instead emphasize how Black communities have taken advantage of the affordances of technologies to assert their humanity, assert their histories and their knowledges and their expertise, which is sort of fundamentally for me, one of the most exciting and important things about digital humanities is the, is the as yet unrealized possibilities of the democratization of knowledge and the possibility for communities to have access uh, to the means of production of knowledge about themselves in their own terms and in their own words and to whatever extent they wish, rather than always having to be the subject of knowledge that is produced by them in the academy. Um, so the volume is also trying to contribute to the vibrant and ongoing conversations about and within global digital humanities you know, through a volume that questions the epistemologies and ontologies uh, that subtend digital humanities scholarship and that seek to center the um, dominant cultures of the global north in knowledge production. Um, and to try and emphasize transnational connections at the same time that it emphasizes the need for attention to local practices and to what digital humanities looks like in particular African diasporic contexts, histories, communities, and languages. What we didn't want to do is have people come away from a volume like this with that sort of Africa is a uh, Africa is a country mentality and to not understand that they're there are many countries, languages, cultures, ethnicities um, in the context of the continent of Africa. Um, and we sought to offer a model for incorporating underrepresented voices uh, and histories within the framework of digital humanities, but to resist colonizing them, which digital humanities sometimes inadvertently ends up doing. Uh, one final note on insights that emerge from the digital Black Atlantic uh, is that when we do work that is explicitly transnational, it often means that we are pushing back against the business as usual of academic scholarship, which in the humanities is often organized by national traditions and then periodized by time periods within the national traditions. Our work of curation and collation articulates the range of, of African diaspora approaches to digital humanities through a broad geographical scope. So we have scholarship in the volume um, from Nigeria, Canada, Dominica, South Africa, United States, Jamaica, and more. Um, and through our editing process, we are really trying to claim space for a digital Black Atlantic through a recognizable form of scholarly communication, the edited volume, as a way of trying to honor the work that had already been done and to really assemble a citable body of work, uh, which we argue why we said we needed this volume in the first place is because we really need scholarship to cite to be able to continue proving the legitimacy of the work we do when it is explicitly not within the um, conception of, of a canon or within to what is valued by dominant white cultures, even in the academy. Uh, so we were also making a statement about how we conceptualize this work. Uh, and to do so in a way that is rooted in the transnational traditions of the African diaspora. So 
we really believed that the form and structure of the volume itself was participating in this work of uh, laying a foundation for the scholarship. So we ended up deciding to organize the volume according to four kind of keywords, if you will, that we felt were very connected to scholarship and the Af in African diaspora studies. So there was memory, uh, crossings, relations, and becomings. And that was our organizing principle from the volume for from the beginning. So memory situates the histories of and contemporary archival impulses towards African diasporic experiences. Uh, crossings then encompasses the fluid and flexible ways that Black Atlantic digital humanities navigates uh, movement across time and space, uh, forging varied spatial and temporal relationships. Relations comes out of the work of Edouard Glissant's conception of networked realized cultures and reveals rhizomatic connections created by exchanges across Black Atlantic spaces, both digital and analog. And then finally, the last one is becomings, which is sort of how are scholars imagining and dreaming about the new configurations of the African diaspora in the um, digital cultural record. So um, some of the feedback that we got uh, during peer review was this question of why these thematic divisions? Why haven't you organized by geographical region? Why have you not organized in the more traditional framing of DH scholarship where you have, you know, here is your, your theory, here is your praxis, here is your pedagogy, which made me laugh considering that's all in the subtitle of uh, my book, New Digital Worlds. Um, and we considered these critiques and we decided to stick with our framing precisely because these other these other framings didn't help us advance the goals of our volume. It didn't help us advance a transnational approach to scholarship. I mean, these categorical divisions, you know, just divide by geography, divide by region, divide by theory and practice and pedagogy, you know, these have been constructed as ways that we think about scholarship. Um, but scholarship of digital humanities in the African diaspora really cuts across theory and praxis and pedagogy. Sometimes it's all of these things. Um, when you are undertaking work that is explicitly transnational, you recognize um, that it's rooted in cultural traditions that also cross over uh, geographical boundaries um, and that them also that's not legible precisely because the scholarship has been marginalized in the broader context of knowledge production. So you have to balance between how do you make this work legible in ways that are going to be recognizable to the people who are peer reviewing your work and to editors and to audiences so they'll understand it, but in doing so in a way that is still authentic to the traditions in which you are working. So the last time that I was talking about the digital Black Atlantic, I actually received a really wonderful question, which is about how transnationalism can perpetuate inequalities. And the specific concern that the person asking raised was how transnationalism, actually how in the context of the African diaspora, do we avoid, for example, the US becoming the dominant site of African diasporic knowledge production? Um, you know, in the case of this volume, uh, as I said before, we have scholars writing on and in and with um, this topic in so many different cultural contexts. But both of us who are editors are actually located in the US and respectively work in African American and Caribbean studies. And so the volume certainly leans more US and Caribbean, um, even though we did make a conscious effort at not having it be exclusively US based in Caribbean. And so that's partially why, or we're in large part why we were intending for the volume to really be the beginning of a conversation, uh, to be able to try and essentially take advantage of the fact that we were able to publish a book in the debates in the digital humanities series so that it was there to be pointed to as the scholarly legitimacy of work at the intersections of Black studies and digital humanities. It's the first volume uh, to actually try and, and put that together and put that out there. Um, so we aren't really trying to be prescriptive, definitive, or say, you know, we've done this volume and it's done at all. It was sort of here, let's open up the conversation. Let's sort of put this out there and, uh, 
hope that others will just take, be able to cite it and push the boundaries further, um, develop their own volumes, develop their own special issues, and we can collectively all move our work forward. And so going back to this question of the tension between global and local, as much as we need these transnational ways of conceptualizing our work, we also need the local and the national and the regional or whatever organizing frame is most suited to showcasing the scholarship that's being produced. Um, to wrap up, I just want to shift um, to address the way that uh, the politics that surround the production of knowledge, which are themselves shaped by colonialism, can really pose challenges to doing transnational work. Uh, because of this, because of this relationship between colonialism and the production of knowledge, the maintenance of archives, the curation um, of, of, uh, of documents, of records. When we do transnational work in digital humanities, or actually even when we do national work and are trying to you know, intervene in the gaps and omissions of a cultural record um, in archives and manuscripts, in cultural heritage materials in a, in a national context, um, our work is fraught because we are encountering the repercussions of decisions that were made by people in positions of power about what material to preserve that then in turn delimits what we can, what kind of claims we can make, what kind of knowledge uh, we can recover, what kind of histories we can reconstruct. And this is something that I've been thinking about in relationship to the Pan-Africanism Data Project, which is a series of data sets on Pan-Africanist events from 1900 to 1959 that were trying to forge global solidarity between people in Africa and in the diaspora. So uh, what it is, is, is we're, for both major events like the Pan-African Congresses and lesser known events, we've used primary and secondary sources uh, to identify participants as these events, where are they coming from, what are their countries of origin, other personal details we can find. <clears throat> we deal with all sorts of complexities that I mentioned before that colonialism has wrought on the production of knowledge and the preservation uh, of knowledge and of cultural heritage. So, you know, we're dealing with, you know, changing names of places over time. We're dealing with the fact that you know contemporary based maps have discrepancies with historical maps and that borders change and that yeah are continuing to shift actually as formerly colonized countries continue to grapple with the legacies of colonialism uh, we are contending with fragmentary material whatever we can find in the fissures created in the cultural record by colonialism. We contend with a lack of care and attention to materials and data of the African diaspora, which means that our research processes for creating these data sets require pulling together fragments and scraps to compile these lists of attendees and where they come from and who they are. In many of the cases we have at, of these events, we've actually been able to find information about total numbers of participants, which is very interesting because then it gives us a really good sense of what proportion of knowledge we are able to pull together and to construct and what we just don't have yet or maybe we'll never have and we'll never have access to. Um, these are the factors of how colonialism shapes archiving and preservation and then in turn our ability to you know, undertake this, this transnational work. So in the case of, for example, the second Pan-Africanist Congress, uh, which was held in 1921 and had these several sessions, one was in London, one was in Brussels, one was in Paris, we have sources that count 113 delegates um, and another saying 110, and we found 93 of them, which actually isn't that bad. 
But as we're doing this, we are drawing on materials that are held in archives all over the world. And by materials, I mean one conference program in Indonesia, which was in Indonesian, um, a newspaper article in France, a diary entry in, in W.B. Du Bois's papers at UMass Amherst, which are fortunately digitized. These sort of fragments through which we are trying to construct these transnational data sets across time, across space, across language. And you'll note, I haven't even mentioned what happened when we started visualizing the data. Uh, so we were, we were, uh, yeah, because I mean, just the data sets to get them where they are and they're not done and they're not complete, um, but there's, they're very interesting and useful and fairly substantial, um, was a year of work, of data, of data work just right there before we can even start thinking about data visualization. Um, if you want to know what happened with data visualizations, well, we were hoping that network analysis might help us understand the intellectual networks within Pan-Africanism, and it did not. Uh, we got a giant hairball that told us nothing new and nothing interesting, um, specifically because like too few people had attended multiple events. Um, w. E. B. Du Bois, uh, who had had a who is the subject of this other project, Global Du Bois, which I'm happy to talk about in the Q and A if you like. Du Bois had attended the most events and he dominated the network, but we wouldn't have needed a network analysis to tell us that Du Bois, who is known as the Godfather of Pan Africanism, was a really influential Pan Africanist, right? Um, it's sort of like um, it's sort of like quantitative textual analysis telling us that Moby Dick is about whales. Like we knew that we knew it's about whales. Um, the digital mapping route was certainly more promising with the data as it um, illuminates a geography of Pan-Africanism that extends beyond countries we typically associate with the African diaspora. Um, certainly we think of US, Canada, United Kingdom, some countries in Europe, Western Europe, um, countries in the Caribbean and Latin America. Um, but because we were starting to see that there were people attending explicitly Pan-Africanist events that were from places like India um, or places uh, like China, we actually expanded our the, the remit and the purview of our work to look at also explicitly Afro-Asian events, a few of them. Um, so first Afro-Asian Writers Conference, uh, which is actually what you're looking at right now, um, because it seemed like there was a lot to explore in terms of the South to South solidarities that were forming in the middle of the 20th century. Um, that kind of um, sort of moment in which a lot of newly colonized countries were trying to sort of figure out where do they fit in relationship to the to world order that was emerging in relationship to the Cold War. And you know what might it mean to imagine cooperation and collaboration with each other. Um, so that's certainly an interesting area um, to examine. Actually, um, just to clarify, this is uh, actually the map of participants at the first Afro-Asian conference. This is the data on the first uh, Afro-American writers conference. Um, and this is the um, Ben Dunn conference, first Afro-Asian international conference. So just to wrap up, I wanna leave you with a key point, which is there are tons of challenges uh, to doing work that illustrates transnational histories and culture and digital humanities. There's you know, questions of language and questions of access and legibility and academic disciplines um, that are periodized in ways that discourage transnational work or that make it invisible. Uh, and I didn't even speak to transnational collaborations, which I have lots of thoughts about and I'm happy to say more about during the Q&A. Uh, but there's, there's, a, there's a lot there in the, way, in the way of challenges, but it's really imperative that we find ways to work around those challenges and to push back against them. To assert that transnational approaches to scholarship, um, particularly transnational work that involves colonized or other oppressed people uh, is valuable and that it requires its own ways of organizing, its own ways of thinking. Um, that's really where our intervention is, is needed. Uh, we are only at the beginning of this work, um, but there's significant promise in transnational approaches to digital humanities, particularly for the digital Black Atlantic, um, and so much more to be done. Thank you.